in American history, seeking their 501c3 uh, status. So of course, and then we'll have our open everything up for Q and A, uh, unless again you have a question before that time. And so again, here we are. Uh, uh, and I'm going to start off with African kingdoms because before we can talk about African American history, uh, I do want to make an acknowledgement to the history of the continent of Africa, partic particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but I always like to make an acknowledgement because the history of Af people of African descent uh, goes back thousands and thousands of years. And so from whether it's ancient Egypt or Kemet, Nubia, Kush, ancient Ghana, Mali, for centuries without any European interruption or incursion, Africans were making a living. They had the different civilizations, different trades. Uh, some were national trades, some were international, particularly on East Africa, they would trade with Asia as far as China. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, trade that was going on in East Africa on the coast as well as trade from south, uh, uh, south of the Sahara, uh, through the Sahara Desert to the Mediterranean, Middle East, and so on and so forth. So Africans were not isolated from other civilizations and they traded with them and they were business people. So that I'm gonna kind of demonstrate how some of those skills were brought here to the Americas in bondage. So first, what we're going to do is take a look at uh, some of the skills that were transferred from Africa to the Americas. Now, of course, if we go with the old trope, when people think about slaves, sometimes they think of them not having a history before being enslaved, or sometimes they may have uh, stereotype images of Africans, kind of like the old Tarzan uh, stereotypes that they were not civilized, and you know, scholars from academies around the world would talk about Africans had no history no civilization and so forth. But some of the skills and trades that were being uh, brought to the Americas on slave ships uh, dealt with such things such as agriculture. For the Africans near the uh, rice, growing rice in the, the area of Sierra Leone, as well as parts of Senegal, they were specifically targeted to grow rice in the low countries of the Carolinas and in Georgia. So that's how you just transfer African skills. So when a person looked at a poster advertising a slave ship, the arrival of the slave ship, they look at the cargo, they look at the Africans and what region they're coming from. And so if you have a rice plantation, you know to go and get that particular ethnic group. Uh, I could go on more later on. South Carolina was very specific about the Africans that they selected to grow the, uh, in the low country to grow the rice and so forth. They were very specific. They didn't use generic terms. They understood the Africans by their ethnicity. Uh, also, there's animal husbandry, uh, taking care of animals. Uh, years ago, uh, there was some research that was done about the connection between Africans from Ghana and horse racing. And how they, you know, the old jockey, uh, stereotype image of the jockey, well, that was a real, that was real, the early African uh, were jockeys from Ghana, from that region, and they were used here for horse racing until, of course, more money got involved in horse racing, and then they were kind of phased out. But you see those skills being brought to the Americas. Now, the other that people, the other skill that sometimes people overlook is the skill of uh, maritime, coastal navigation skills, ocean, ocean navi uh, navigation skills. Now, this is me in, in Senegal. I had a partnership when I was at Coney Lynchburg. And this is a demonstration of the GRIO, the importance of memory. But when you come to the maritime uh, uh, cultures, these are the men going out to fish. Some of them will not come back. They're going in the Atlantic Ocean. This is near Dakar, a, a village called Kaya. And they're drying the fish. And these fish will be sold at markets. And the marketers were the women. So here's a woman who coming to my uh, exchange partner's house, and she's selling the fish. So you see this kind of partnership between men and women. Next, you see woodworking, the type of skills that enslaved people would have. These Africans were familiar with woodworking, so they may have become carpenters, coopers, uh, wheelwrights. So those skills pre-existed for the Africans who were brought here to the Americas. Now, also it's panning, they're making djembe drums. 
So they're preparing uh, the skin, but tanners were also a skill here in the colonial time period in Virginia. And then of course they could use those skills as um, woodwork working skills to make other useful objects, utilitary objects. Then it was also weaving, textile. The Africans had a tradition of textiles. You can see these are two textile workers. There's one on the other end. And uh, so that is another skill. Then you would come to other skills like smithing, goldsmithing, blacksmiths. Blacksmiths were sold at a high price because their skills were valued. And this is a, a, a goldsmith, uh, been handed down from generation to generation who made me this uh, particular uh, ornament. And they're also making jewelry as well. So again, many of these skills that the Africans are bringing to the Americas, they're not coming as unskilled labor. Also, there's the uh, tradition of architecture, like shotgun houses, talk about that later. But this is a monument on Gore Island to the transatlantic slave trip. And it overlooks the Atlantic Ocean because Dakar, Senegal is the closest part of the West African continent to the United States. Um, now, next, now, that brings us all the way to, some of you may be familiar with Sam Harris, the cheap store, which was on the corner of the uh, Duke of Gloucester Street and Botetourt Street. Now, I just brought this up to talk a little bit about how enslaved people could transfer their skills from slavery to, um, to if they became free, how they could transfer many of those skills. And uh, so for instance, you can have, uh, as I mentioned before, Africans who had various skills that they became free, they would use those skills. But also you have to look at the free black population, which tends to be overlooked many times because people focus quite often on slavery. So with free blacks, and we can talk about this later, free blacks, um, most of them before the revolution were biracial people, mostly between black men and white women. And when I tell people that at a genealogy conference, they're like, really? Are you, yes, we can discuss that later. But most of those, what you had to do in order to become a free black is you had to serve as an apprentice for 30 years. After 30 years, you would then become a free black. During those 30 years, you're being taught a skill so that you can make a living on your own, to be self-sustaining. Because they didn't want, there's no welfare system, no safety net. So everybody had to make a living. So the free black population is actually the one can argue as the foundation of black businesses in this country. It was out of necessity. No one was gonna help a free black uh, community survive. So there was safety in numbers and they had to put together their resources. And they also had to engage with the white community because many of their customers were gonna be whites in the colonial time period as well as or during slavery. So you have a group of people who are moving back and forth between the black and enslaved community, free black community, as well as the white community. So there's a lot of engagement that's going on uh, during that time period. And so one example I can give you is uh, uh, public spaces. I just wanna say, where did free blacks and slaves conduct their business, if you will, informal business? Let me explain. If you're familiar with the uh, courthouse in Colony Williamsburg, it's a big open field. And throughout Virginia, they had marketplaces such as that. Uh, right now, they have a marketplace set up in front of the magazine. But nevertheless, enslaved people as well as free Blacks were able to go to those marketplaces. Uh, and there, they could sell their goods. We know at Carter's Grove, when that was open, that uh, not just Carter's Grove, but other places, you could sell, an enslaved person could take excess crop from their garden and go to the marketplace and sell it. So there was ways for them to make money. It was like an, an economy. But there was a, a, another way to make money. There was a, 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 a black woman. They said she was very fair skinned. She was in Williamsburg. She was a slave. She ran away and she would come into Williamsburg and she would sell her cakes. Remember how I said women were involved in marketing in Africa, right? She would come into Williamsburg, even though she knew her owner was right there in Williamsburg. She would walk around in Williamsburg, cakes. Cakes, cakes, and she would sell her cakes. And so eventually her owner got word that she was coming in and out of the city. But again, you can see the entrepreneurship making a living. Uh, even though she should have been hiding, she came right back to the place 
where she uh, escaped to sell her case. Um, also, the, during this time period, some extraordinary people would be Paul Cuffey of Massachusetts, who owned ships. He owned a shipyard. Um, you have a tavern owner as well in New Jersey. Uh, but also other private places where enslaved people could make money would be from their owners at Carter's Grove. We knew that sometimes uh, Mr. Carter would borrow money. Well, first of all, let me get back to borrowing money. Uh, some of the slaves that would sell fish and other goods to their owners. So this was another way to make money. Uh, again, using that entrepreneurship, uh, even though they were enslaved. Uh, then there was also the Christmas box during the holiday season. That was similar to, uh, any of you been like to New York or a place where you have to tip people, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not from New York and you're not familiar with tipping people, what do they tend to do? They tend to kind of just stand there. Well, this at least was my experience. You know, they take your bag or something. They'll kind of stand there like, they wait for the tip. Exactly. And uh, Philip Fitz's Fithian described that same uh, type of uh, ritual, if you will, between slave owners and their enslaved during the, the uh, Christmas season. They would stand there waiting for their tip. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there were different types of markets or economies amongst the enslaved community and different places. Uh, now, also, when it came to free Blacks here in Winsburg, we have the Ashby family, we still have descendants. Of the Ashby family in Williamsburg, one of the Williamsburg Lodge wings of one wing of the Williamsburg Lodge is named after the Ashby family. Again, a biracial family. The mother was a, a, an English woman, worked at King's Arms Tavern. We don't know who the black father was, but she had two mulatto children, John and Matthew Ashby. And Matthew had to go about the process of purchasing his wife's and children's freedom. Now, in order, well, not their freedom. He had to purchase them. He didn't purchase their freedom. So he had to go through that process of purchasing his wife and his children. So that means he had to work. He had to make a living. And we do know some of the activities he, were, he was involved in to raise that money. So you can see some of the complexities of this economy uh, when you talk about free Blacks. Because imagine this. Many times when people talk about slavery, they just kind of leave free Blacks out to the side. But it's really complex because in many cases, it was early on the free black men who many of them who married enslaved women. Now, of course, it wasn't a legal marriage, but they would marry the enslaved woman and they would have children. So now the next step is who do you free first? You have the capability to raise enough money, and your owner, your your spouse owner doesn't have to sell you to uh, the free black man. But if he does, you have to raise the money, you have to decide who to set, who to purchase first. And, you know, back then, average lifespan about 45 years of age. So you don't have that much time. And if you, as the free Black man, uh, were to die before you uh, purchase your wife, she would remain enslaved, as well as your children. So you get this complexity of this Black economy, where making a living sometimes is also saving, your, uh, or, saving or protecting your family. So it's not just making money here or there, but it's about your family as well as your, your family uh, lineage. Um, there were also black markets. Uh, eventually, many of the slave owners caught on. They felt that free blacks and slaves had like this theft ring, you know, this little organized ring of theft that enslaved people would steal things and give it to free blacks, and the free blacks were going to sell it, you know. So eventually in Surrey County, Surrey County, for a moment, they thought they had a solution. Because they said when they saw the Blacks going to these meetings or these gatherings, they were dressed too good. Mm -hmm. They were dressed in nice, fine linen. And there's other stories about Blacks that are stealing cloth and making their own clothes. We'll talk about that later. So they came up with a solution. They said, because of the fact that we can't really stop the Blacks from stealing this and maybe they the free black they're helping them. What we're going to do is we're going to make them wear blue and white. So if they're wearing anything other than blue and white in Surrey County, we know that they stole those clothes. So that gives you a sense of some of the measures 
that the authorities are trying to go through to stop uh, enslaved people and free black from trying to express themselves culturally and developing their own economy, even though it was an informal uh, economy. And lastly, as uh, uh, slavery comes to the end with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that abolished slavery in 1865, you have uh, many of those uh, businesses that free Blacks had will become businesses such as if you were a coachman, and if any of you know Wyoni uh, Ingram, she now teaches at VCU, Wyoni Edwards Ingram, uh, she wrote a paper on transportation, some of the legacy of coaching, coach, African-American coach companies that have buses. Some of the legacy goes back to African-American coachmen who became free, who would use their coaching skills and travel to have businesses. Food caterers, if you are a cook, you use your food uh, uh, making skills to create businesses as a caterer. Uh, obviously blacksmiths, as we'll see, we'll see in a moment when we get to the MLK marker, blacksmiths also can make a living in the community. They were very important. So you see this transfer of skill. Now, one of the most successful, which we, again, we can talk about later, were black barbers. Um, they were able to do things that most black businesses could not accomplish at the time period during slavery and after slavery, particularly black barbers who had white clientele only. And some of you may know, even going into the 20th century, I was told there were certain barbershops in Richmond that still, uh, black barbershops that still only uh, serve white clientele. Um, so again, so you see this transfer of skills from uh, a time of bondage and free blacks to a time of freedom after 1865. And Sam Harris is one example. He has an extraordinary story. When he opened the cheap store uh, right there on the Duke of Gloucester Street in Botata, uh, there's more archaeology of the Black community that was within that vicinity, the James City County Training School um, and others. And uh, Mr. Parker and Mrs. Parker are very familiar with those. They may bring that up, or you may ask them a question about it as we go forward. So now, that's your historical background. And so now we're going to transition to uh, the Utopia Quarter at Kings Mill uh, Resort. And at this, uh, this started around 1995. 1995, uh, there was a burial of about 25 enslaved people. We don't know what they looked like, but they more than likely, as West African, they had their country march. Today, it's popular to have piercings and tattoos. And, but when, I, when, when Africans first arrived here, that was seen as barbaric and savage. So you, obviously, people change their mind about what they think about those type of imagery uh, from the time period, as well as some of them had their teeth filed. Uh, but they were referred to as country marks. You can even see their hair uh, very close to like dreadlocks today that many young people wear the natural hair, the dreads and so forth, beards, and, and so on, because those marks identify them with their ethnicity, with their ethnic group. And so it's a James River Institute in 1995. Uh, they began doing some excavation uh, at the site owned by Bush Gardens, and not Bush Gardens, Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. And they owned that site, but they did some archeological research. And here's a brochure for a ceremony, which we'll talk about called the season of remembrance that we do every December in honor of uh, the 25 enslaved people. Uh, I'm just doing a little comparison here. Some of the things that they found at the site were very similar to what was at the archaeological lab in Senegal. When I was there uh, in Senegal, they were starting to do some research and digitizing some of the archaeological objects they found on Gore Island itself. Because during the transatlantic slave trade, you have not just people going across the Atlantic, you've got plants, you've got food, you've got objects moving back and forth across the Atlantic. And so here are some, uh, some uh, samples of uh, different types of pipes. So again, having pipes and beads would not be anything uh, new to many of the uh, people at Utopia or throughout Virginia, the first generation Africans. So now we're gonna transition to the season of remembrance. And uh, Mr. Parker, now, when the James, uh, James uh, River Institute of Archaeology uh, made these findings, how did you then get involved with 
you as well as the, the black community get involved with James River Institute and their findings? I would say that it started out with once they found the remains, the burial grounds on uh, King Mills property, they were clearing land for more townhouses, and this was near the James River. And there was a block there, and in grading it down, preparing for building, that's when they discovered the grave site. And uh, the James River Institute of Archaeology, they were the ones that uh, did the digging and what have you. They uh, studied them, and uh, but then they had to have they had to include the black community in order to basically to remove them, study them, and then to reinter them. And this is where, I guess you could say, this is actually the beginning of the Friends of African American History, because the group uh, that was started by Marie Shepherd, uh, who was at First Baptist Church, she was the historian. Uh, for First Baptist Church here in Williamsburg. And uh, they sent out, uh, she sent out letters uh, to the churches in the community, the surrounding area, to come together so that, uh, you know, we could be involved in the, uh, the study and what would happen to the remains of those uh, uh, Africans that uh, remains that they found at Kings Mill site. And so the letters were sent out, and I was interested. Our church received one, so I decided to go to the meeting. And, and there were several churches involved at the very beginning. And uh, we came together and we decided uh, what uh, we wanted to do, and with the uh, cooperation of Kings Mills properties, what have you, after the remains were studied and what have you, we then uh, decided that we would like a memorial site where all of the remains were interred together and there would be a monument in remembrance of those that were enslaved at Utopia site. And uh, so working with Kings Mills property and what have you, we have that uh, now have uh, the monument there. It's been there for uh, wow over twenty over twenty years now, and uh, every every year we have a, a season of remembrance. We were interrupted with COVID, but. Uh, even when they had COVID, uh, one of us would go down to the site uh, the third Saturday in December, about noon, and uh, say a prayer of remembrance for those uh, early Americans, uh, African Americans, that labored uh, at Utopia site. So it was a started out as a total effort from the community to become involved because we, as I'm trying to decide how to say this, but they had to involve the black community in order to deal with the remains of those early Africans that were at Utopia site. So that's how we got involved. And uh, once we got involved and, you know, we decided uh, what we wanted in partnership with, uh, with Kings Mills property, they, uh, you know, they decided where they would want it. And we moved several times. And it's interesting that uh, our final move, they placed us where, Eagles were nesting, and uh, you know where eagles nest, you can't do any building or anything like that. But eventually, the eagles left, and uh, then they 
resurveyed the property. And that's why, uh, if when you look at the, the pictures that uh, we are, there's a fence behind us and the, right next to us, there's a house. Mm -hmm. But it did not start out initially like that. Mm -hmm. There was a wooded area uh, behind us. And from that wooded area, once the Eagles left, we would then uh, uh, have what we have today. Okay. And after, uh, we're going to take a break, see if you have any questions in just a moment. The first one I asked uh, Mrs. Par Parker, Dolores Parker. Uh, so, how did SOPA decide to remember the African and African descended people at the uh, burial site at Utopia Quarter? What type of uh, uh, programs and why were those programs uh, selected activities? As Mr. Parker said, we started having the moral services. Uh, we designated the third Saturday in December, the coldest day of the year, <laughs> outside. <laughs> Didn't bring your blankets, but I brought you. Mm -hmm. But we celebrated it with a season for remembrance. Um, we had our scripture and prayer. Uh, the purpose started out with just the purpose. Now we have a laying of the wreath. And as seen, that was seen in, on the screen, the wreath was made by the two of us, which goes back and has all the shells, the, um, even the cloth, uh, kente cloth, as well as burlap, uh, pipes, we were able to find pipes and therefore stones and everything that resembled in the history of our ancestors. The service continues on with music. Yes, we had music. <laughs> what is it? What is it without a surrounding of for blacks not to have music? We had organizations, musical organizations throughout parts of Virginia. But uh, the favorite musician there. And my favorite was the Buffalo Boys. They represented uh, the Black music. And if you hear them, they go, and that's what the slaves were doing when they were just sitting around, but everybody knew what they were saying. But um, we had the speaker, we had a 10 to 15 minute speaker. And you don't find them too much now, but uh, we imposed on them 10 to 15 minutes. We had various ones to come in um, from all over these boys, Richmond and Michigan, so forth. And we have the President at that time, which was Mr. Parker, uh, give a little more information. The King's Mill uh, representative was there, gave a very short spill. Then it was over. We were there no more than 30, 45 minutes. You know, like I said, it was cold out there mm -hmm. and we had to go. But we could stay. On Sundays, we stayed longer. Uh, the Site, as he said, was Eagles. But the neighbor that has the house behind indicated that she had seen a couple of Eagles in the area recently, which is very, very good. Um, that's about basically it. But uh, like I said, it's the remembrance of the of our ancestors. 
is very, very important to me because I'm always trying to find out who they are and how far can I go back. We, again, we have a program the third Saturday in December, and I pray uh, that we will be able to go down to the Kingsman site. It's open to the public year-round. Mm -hmm. um, if you need information for like, directions, I can give them to you, um, or you can get them at the gate when you go in. Sometimes they don't know, but uh, somebody will be able to give you the information. Just a small little site. And I enjoy it. And I hope you will too on the third Saturday in December. And we hope that we can get the participation in this particular ceremony of remembrance. And just one quick story I want to share with you. The, the uh, resident who lives behind that, that uh, whose house is, you see in the back background, she comes out every year. And she said one uh, Thanksgiving, she said it was an African-American family at King's Mill. And she saw them during Thanksgiving having part of their Thanksgiving meal there on the bench in front of the marker. So it was giving us a sense of how the community was actually using it. So the fact that you know, we have to thank King's Mill for setting, because you can see the transition. You saw the field kind of muddy at first before the house was built, and then you can see the benches. And so you see that transition of, of the contribution that King's Mill made to making it uh, a very beautiful place to be, a place of uh, remembrance, King's Mill Resort. Mr. Hodder. Yes. One other thing I would like to say, um, we've come up uh, with a song at the end of the service. I'm free. I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's another blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. Okay. Thank you. And at this moment, we didn't have this plan, but I like to make sure that we have some engagement as we move on. So before we go to the MLK uh, triangle marker, I just wanted to see if there's maybe one or two questions or clarification that anyone needs at this moment about. Parker kind of cleared it up because I was going to ask who were they, who did they work for, how many men, how many women, how many children. So. Um, that information we have because the James City, I just don't remember it off the top of my head, but the James River Institute did do a paper and they did break down the uh, sex ratio as well as the children. It did seem like from the remains that they obviously they were slaves, but you can tell by stresses on the bones and on the joints. And they could tell that that was a problem there. Infant mortality was also because we had some infants who were buried. Uh, so Unfortunately, it's something, you know, when I hear today uh, that uh, African-American women are suffer the highest infant, well, it's not, not infant mortality, but I mean, that's one, but also, what's the word? The maternal. Maternal mortality is a higher rate for African-American women, but I always think of it going all the way back and uh, to the very beginning, because you also have to consider the trauma that the women had to face during the Middle past. What effect would that have on their body and their ability to, to reproduce, uh, as well as the sex ratio numbers early on were not even. There were more males than uh, females, not till like the 1690s, 80s, 90s, that the sex ratio begins to even out and you start having the black population begin to grow. Um, but even today, they say even in West Africa, it's still high. The West African women still have it higher than women in Asia and in Europe. So it's, it's, it's a mystery why that's the case because it's in West Africa today as well as here in the United States uh, and early in, in, in early in American uh, history. Any other question or comment? Yes. Um, did they have? Do they have the name of any ship that might have been in the area? Um, I don't remember seeing that in the paper. No. In the paper, but I could cross reference it to the slave trade uh, slave voyages database. 
which is a, uh, online. They have a list of all the ships when they arrive and so forth. So by matching up the time period when they arrive, we might be able to find out what particular ships, and then that will give us an uh, idea of what, which region. Uh, some of the early Africans were brought here from Angola, um, uh, but then we know by the time of Cars Grove, uh, right there on the James River as well, um, uh, from Lorena Walsh's book from Calabar to Cars Grove, you know, a lot of them came from Calabar, which would be Nigeria. So, uh, so it, it would be a matter of cross-referencing that information. Um, also, just real quick on the James River, um, the Africans were sold directly from the ships. So the owners would go like, uh, you know, car, he would go right directly onto the slave ship and he would pick out the Africans he wanted and then he or his son would give them names and they had to go by that particular name. Yes, sure. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that you might say something about this later. So if this is not the time, you just let me know. But you mentioned that uh, a lot of the free slaves were the product of um, white women, African men. Yes. At indigenous service, but still white women. Uh, wow. Well, uh, a couple of things. We can talk about that a little later, but I'll, I'll we'll just touch later. on it right now. I can read it later. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll. So your question will be the first one we'll address after okay. they come out. Okay. Yes, Mr. Park. I just wanted to address an earlier question. The question was asked about uh, the uh, number of adults and children, and it says that there were, uh, it was a total of 25, and uh, of the number, uh, there were, 12 containing the names of infants or small children. So 12 of that 25 uh, would have been infants or small children. And also on Utopia Quarter, uh, very early on, because this starts like in the 1600s, 1700s, uh, they did have white indentured servants on that property as well. So again, you get a, 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 a chance for interracial mixing because there's no cop at every corner to stop you back then. I mean, it's a big world. There's one, some things you can't stop back then. Yes. We have a question from a virtual um, person asking for the address of the site or directions to the site. Uh, the slave ship voyages? No, sorry, to the um, Utopian site. Oh, Utopia, right now, unfortunately, we just have, actually, right now, we just have a uh, Facebook, which is facebook.com. And matter of fact, it's on, it's on, it's going to be on the last slide, but okay. facebook.com uh, forward slash SOFA, which is S O, I mean, Society of Friends of African American History, which is S O F A A H dot D A for Virginia. Okay. So, yes. oh, well, she, I think she was asking for the address for the Utopia site. Oh, for the Utopia site or the website? Website. I thought you said website. The what? The Utopia site? Okay. Oh, yeah, that was the best. Okay, mm -hmm. the Utopia site, the easiest way to get it is off of Route 60 at the Kings Mill entrance. Uh, when you go to the gate, got to get your approval to go in. Continue on the road, which is like 10 miles an hour, 12, 15 miles an hour. The first left, can't remember the name, but it's the first left. Parham Road. Parham. Parham Road, the first left. Follow that down all the way down um, till you get closer to the river. You get close to the river and you see Parham will stop. And there's a road in front of you with the neighborhood. Neighborhood, neighborhood is all over, but at that intersection, this is built up there. And I'm giving you from memory. When you get to the intersection here, and there's a street over here where the new neighborhood is, you bear to your right. Go around the curve. Once you get around and you see the river, before you get and go over to the river, there is the site for you to it's very very small and as you saw the house that was behind us you will see that house there that house was not there and we were very upset about that too 
So there's nothing we can do. The Eagles were gone. King's Mill wanted the property. So. And they still stayed at building all down. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you like afterwards, we have it written as yeah. well. But we have a question. I'd like to scan one of those if okay. you don't have extra one later. Thanks. Okay. Right there. All right, we're going to, uh, it's 344, so we're going to move on to the MLK marker and then we'll address any of the other questions uh, after the MLK uh, section. Uh, so the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, triangle uh, monument is, uh, again, a monument that many people may have walked by. Um, and this particular mon monument, you, might, you may recognize it now. Again, Scotland Street is in the center. It's right down the street from First Baptist Church on Scotland Street, Armistead Avenue, and um, Prince George. Uh, and so that's the location. And uh, so uh, right now, you can see in the background is the part of the neighborhood that I think there's the couple of stores like Williamsburg, uh, no, William and Mary Bookstore, and a few other businesses in that area. So we're going to talk about this uh, particular uh, uh, monument, and I'm going to address uh, the question to uh, Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker, after the Utopia Quarter and Burial Ground Project was established, the community also addressed uh, the concern for the lack of African-American history in Williamsburg, uh, specifically to, to uh, uh, the Williamsburg area, since Utopia site is at King's Mill. And there was nothing inspirational about the uh, contributions of African Americans in the 20th century in Williamsburg. And so there was a concern that, that uh, something should be done uh, to recognize uh, the African American community, and in particular, uh, the uh, business community in the Triangle area. And the area was going under the jurisdiction of the Redevelopment and Housing Authority in Williamsburg. Uh, and so as they were about to redevelop that area, uh, society, not society, but the Friends of African American History, uh, uh, Mr. Parker can explain how they stepped in to address the need to leave some type of evidence of and memory of African Americans in that community. And this is like a quick, pretty rough looking from a newspaper slide of what the, that part of the triangle looked like in 1976. It was pretty bad condition at that point before they were going to do some uh, renovation. So, Mr. Parker, could you tell us a little bit about that transition, uh, the need for memory of the African-American community and what led to the MLK marker? I would say it begins with the Williamsburg Redevelopment and Housing Authority when they began to redo that whole area. That was one of the major areas of uh, black population in the city of Williamsburg. So when the housing authority came to redevelop it, the black families that uh, lived on Scotland Street and they had uh, Armstead Avenue, and, uh, you know, of course, the businesses that were in the Triangle area, all of that was done away with. And uh, they, uh, those of us here in Williamsburg know that the, once they did that, they uh, set aside Christmas addicts. And that was where some of the, uh, the Black families would go to stay. Uh, at Christmas Addicts, and uh, now it's not all black. At one time it was, but over a period of time, uh, you know, people die and people move in and whatever property is sold. But uh, we felt a need to have some type of presence uh, to show the presence of. Uh, you know, the African American uh, in Williamsburg. Everything and everywhere there had been African Americans in uh, Williamsburg was sort of phased out. Uh, 
where the uh, James City County Training School was. That was on the corner of, of uh, Nicholson and Body Tie. At one time, they put a plaque there, but later they removed the plaque. And of course, uh, that uh, later became Bruton Heights. And uh, I see some of see one of them, one that uh, went to Bruton Heights along with me. Uh, and so, but uh, where there were houses, where, there, where families live, uh, there's nothing to show or say anything about that. Uh, and also on South Henry Street, uh, where the, uh, the mental institution, the Eastern State Hospital was on the corner of Francis and South Henry Street. And uh, on South Henry Street, as you would go down past the mental institution, uh, that was uh, a large black neighborhood. And, uh, but uh, you go down there now and uh, you, don't, you don't see that. The only thing that's there from that time is the, uh, the Masonic Temple that's still there. And that was from the early, the early days. So we thought it, you know, we needed to show that, you know, at one time there were, you know, a lot of blacks in the area, living in the area, stayed in the area. And they were all over Williamsburg, not just uh, in the, uh, you know, Scotland Street and Armstead Avenue, uh, uh, Prince George Street, but all over Williamsburg. Some of you might remember York Street. Anyone remember York Street? Yes, I'm old as a well. York oh. Street. <laughs> York Street going east uh, out of Williamsburg. Uh, there's, a, there's a field there now where Colonial Williamsburg has uh, horses. Uh, well, that used to be basically a neighborhood. And it was predominantly uh, black. They had the service station sort of at the when you go into York Street, and then uh, there were you know there were houses, there were family houses, uh, also uh, White and Terry the funeral home was located on York Street uh, early on, and uh, there was Watts Motor Company. But the rest of it was family housing and what have you. They had a, you know, there was a restaurant there, but uh, that was white. But uh, that York Street was predominantly black. That was a black neighborhood. Uh, but none of that's there. So that's a little history behind why we wanted to do this monument. And uh, because in the Triangle Block, there were black businesses there. We uh, researched it and found uh, we could, uh, you know, identify nine. And uh, the late Dr. Baker, who was a member of the uh, Friends of African American History, he was the one that really lobbied to have uh, that presence uh, in uh, on the Triangle site. Uh, and one of his saying to us that. Uh, you know, most major cities in the United States had something about uh, Dr. King or what have you, and uh, they thought it only proper that there be something here in Williamsburg to remember Dr. King. That's why it's the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, triangle block. And but so we would uh, get permission. Uh, to do that, to remember the entrepreneurs that labored there, but also to uh, put a monument 
uh, for Dr. King, and that's uh, ongoing, that's in progress. You can't imagine what you have to go through to do that. But uh, someday, hopefully, there will be some type of monument to remember Dr. King. Whether or not it will be a statue, uh, I won't say, but it will be a monument uh, to remember him. And uh, so that's uh, that's how we uh, start with that. And uh, as I said, the nine entrepreneurs there, uh, Dr. Bladen, I'm going to try to name them, Dr. Bladen. It's on Slack. It's on Slack. Dr. Bladen, we had uh, uh, Mr. Clarence Webb, uh, Charlie Gary, uh, Mr. Sant, Mr. S.K. Harris, uh, Mr. Earl Henderson, uh, Mr. Thomas Webb, the Mr. Uh, Wise, and he had the barbershop. So everybody would go there to get the hair cut. Uh, also, Ms. Virgie, Ms. Virgie Webb, and uh, Mr. William Webb. And uh, Mr. Norman Jones, he had the ice cream parlor. Uh, Mr. Charlie Gary, uh, he had the tailor shop and uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning this. And uh, I think, Dolores, you want to say a little more about uh, Dr. Blake? Because just a moment before she uh, says that. Because uh, I'm being conscious of our time. So after she says that, we're going to have to move on to uh, Dr. Bakari. But these are just some images of the dedication that took place in 2004 when the monument was uh, uh, dedicated. And uh, there are a couple of people that uh, uh, Mrs. Parker is going to talk about. Uh, these are some of the images the top three Mr. Webb, Blayton, and Gary. Mr. Webb, Mr. Clarence Webb, everybody knew him. You were a child in Winsburg and you knew off the streets. You knew him. Um, the can he had the new grocery store, it became a more of a store for us kids <laughs> where we would go in and candy, candy, candy. Uh, the big rock and roll uh, cookie bars like this, five cents. Um, and I didn't live in the neighborhood. I lived across the tracks in Holland Park but when I would come up to go to, to First Baptist Church, to Sunday school, vacation Bible school, church, and so forth. But vacation Bible school, the store was open. You know, and after vacation Bible, you had your little money to put in vacation Bible school, had your little money to go to the Mr. Webb's. So we'd all go there and get our little goodies for the next day. And you'd be amazed. It was very nice, clean, but it was what we all needed was to get away and be able to buy something for ourselves. Well, regardless of what age you were, a penny goes a long way, <laughs> especially when you got a, a lot of pop <laughs> or the candy cigarettes <laughs> or whatever, you know. All the old fashioned candy was purchased in that store along with other groceries. Um, Dr. Blake, I can say a lot and I can say a little. Um, the services, you know, his services started way before I was born. But once I was born, I was born there and I was. My family and people in the neighborhood, everybody went to Dr. But he was the only, the only, he was the first black doctor there with that owned and operated a hospital. Mm -hmm. If you went to him, there was concern, attention, and knowledge. I mean, it's not like today where you have 
We had also writers here, there, and everywhere. Maybe five different doctors. He took care of everything. There was no 15 minute conference uh, visit. However long it took, you were there. But that's what I can say about him. He was uh, a dynamite man. And every, like I said, everybody went to him when you went to work, when you went to naval weapon stations, um, Colonial Williamsburg or wherever. If you went to him, <laughs> he was there and able to help. And he went to him. Right. This, okay, <laughs> one more thing. I, uh, the uh, Friends of African American History, I guess we put the horse before the car. We started doing a lot of things and we neglected to get a 501c3. And if you're going to have a nonprofit organization or whatever, that's something you must have especially if you want to do things and need money. And uh, certainly the members don't have enough money to do the monuments and to do this. So you're going to have to have the help of the community to do that. And fortunately, after struggling for, I don't know, for a good number of years, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Marie Bakari, who was, uh, she was doing some work for our church uh, and uh, in that way. And we got to talking and she asked, you know, asked something about it. And uh, she said that she would help. And ever since then, and even a little before, we worked, she's worked together with us. And it's because of her that we were able to get that 501c3. So when we solicit money now, uh, you know, we live. We talk about the second question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Parker, for uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, it, it was with great pleasure that. I was able to help the, uh, Mr. Parker and the Society of Friends of African American History um, acquire that 501c3 status. Um, but what I what I um, want to bring to the table here is where we started our conversation today. Um, Mr. McCarty brought up several um, things that are very near and dear to my heart in that they were part of my original research, which is entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial skills. And the challenges that African Americans face when they try to go into business. And it's not just here locally, it's not just in ways where my study was actually in Newport News. But what happens is that there's not generational knowledge, there's not uh, generational money that goes along with African Americans um, who want to go into business. There's such a thing as a necessity entrepreneur people who have to go into business just to stay alive. Okay. It, it's a darn shame that we have to see that in this country today. However, um, one of the things that's really missing is that basic knowledge of how the American system of business works and how to navigate it. So um, I enjoy helping people do just that to navigate these challenges that they encounter uh, with business or try to get into business or trying to do business the right way and stay out of trouble. And I've seen people get into some serious trouble. You know, it's no fun when the IRS agent goes up, gun in hip, asking me for somebody's paperwork. It's like, sure, here, you know. But people can get themselves into some serious trouble. So I would say to, um, any person who comes to me or who I have an opportunity to encounter, surround yourself with people who have that knowledge. Don't be afraid to ask, reach out. There's lots of opportunity here in this country. My folks are actually from the Caribbean, not, um, I'm, not, I'm a naturalized citizen, but 
I see the struggles on a regular basis. And the biggest thing that's missing is the knowledge of the system in which they have to operate. So, you know, nothing wrong with learning a little bit, but asking those hard questions and reaching out and um, seeking the help that you need. Learn the system so that you can work within the system and be prosperous. Um, we've seen that uh, throughout history where, you know, people were removed from their homeland, brought here, but they were still able to prosper to a certain degree within limits, but they were still able to do it because they learned the system. They learned how to navigate through the system and they were still able to care for their families and purchase their relatives away from slave owners. Um, even uh, with the folks in the 20th century in the triangle, the reason, most of the reason that they were there is because half of them were there to serve a need of the community and population. Others were simply, it was a survival mechanism. How else do you provide for your family if somebody isn't going to give you work? You make yourself useful. And this is something I think is it's, it's part of the entrepreneurial spirit. And people don't recognize necessarily that they have this. They don't have a name for it, but they do these things on a regular basis because it is their way to move their family forward, to um, to make a name for themselves, to do something in their community. Ms. Bakari, I'll hand yes. it back. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakari. Okay, so at this moment, we're gonna transition to the Q&A, because we have about 10, 14 minutes left officially, but I have to answer, ask, I see like four hands went up, but I need to answer her question real quick because I did promise I was talking to her question, which has to do with the interracial uh, uh, mixing between African men and, and, and uh, right. European. It, it comes down to it technically early on, it's African men and European women. These are Africans that come directly from Africa, and European women come directly from Europe. If you know something about the history of Europe uh, for the European women, depending on what class they were, what status, if they were servants, they were looked down upon. So there's no, none of this, oh, I'm shamed because I'm with a black man. They shame you anyway. Okay, they had bridal ships because there weren't enough white women or European women in the colony. Mm -hmm. And they would bring bridal ships over because many of the white men or settlers didn't have wives. So even with that competition happening with few women, you've got men who are competing for women, and uh, many Africans, uh, and if you know anything about African culture, spiritually, no offense to anyone, but spiritually, uh, having children was a way for your spirit to live on. Okay, so uh, having families, having children was critical in West Africa for West African men and, and women as, as well. So if there's not enough African women, and there's white women, and there's some Native American women, people are going to do what people are going to do at that time period. So it did happen more as you, you than people think because we have the more recent history of lynching and you know stay away from white women, it could be trouble. But before that, particularly if you've done your DNA, you go back far enough in your DNA and your family genealogies, you're going to see that uh, for many African Americans, particularly from the South, you're going to see some white ancestry, and that doesn't always mean it was the slave master. If you have some white ancestry, there's a probability it could have been a white woman. Um, also, for many Americans who today identify as white, if they do, because I tell you, when you take a DNA test, be real careful about what you you shake that family tree. And there's been a number of people identify as white Americans who will find out just a few generations ago that they, their ancestors were actually mulatto, which meant that there was an African uh, progenitor somewhere in their family as well. So, so those African women, I mean, those African men and European women, uh, and, and on the Eastern shore, it was even Maryland, even more so. Uh, but does that answer your question? Yes, and I would imagine that would have been before, uh, that would have been before it was said that, um, you were a slave. You, you were a slave because your mom was a slave. 
that 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 um uh, uh, what was that? What was that rule? What yeah, was that case? Uh, uh -huh. 1662, the condition uh -huh. of the mother is the condition there you of go, the child. The condition of the mother. Mm -hmm. the, okay, I got you. Well, when they were working that out, what happened is they were working out the condition of the mother is the condition of the child. Yeah. So the woman, black woman, yeah. she has a child. The father can be white, Indian, Native American, uh, Native American white or African, that child's going to be enslaved. If you can have blue eyes, blonde hair, it doesn't matter. That child's going to be enslaved. However, if the child, mulatto child, has a white mother, then they made different laws about what happens to the child. And one of the punishments for that interaction was that the mother would have to serve extra time if she was a indentured servant, like Mary Ashby. Oh, she was whipped, and the man was found. Yeah, she, the law said that she could be whipped, but we were trying to find uh, examples of that because we're like, oh yeah, they're going to whip a white woman in public. I mean, everybody really. And when we went back, we found out in many cases you could also pay a fine. You pay that fine, she wouldn't be whipped. Yeah. And so in many cases, they, you know, someone would pay that fine, and she, she wouldn't be whipped uh, in public. Um, so there were different laws when it came to uh, biracial children. So just to give you a sense of the, the biracial children had to work for the first 30 years as an apprentice. They'd be bound out to most, more than likely a white family, in some cases to a free black family. After they reached that age of 30, they should be counting because some people are going to keep them longer, right? Uh, then they become free blacks, officially free blacks. And of course, the average lifespan is, was at that time, people was about 45. Mm -hmm. So I could say more, but did that answer the core? It answers the question. That's good. Okay. I'm going to get your card later. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think I have like three right there in the red. And then, and then, okay. and then we'll come to Miss Lee. I just have one quick question. Were any of those businesses that were in the triangle area, are they in the green book? Oh, are Ooh, they in the yeah. green book? That's a damn question. The new one is they're working on the green book. Oh, they are? Yeah. You know, perhaps I, I would, I'm just taking an educated guess, but perhaps uh, the uh, the Addicts Hotel might have been, that would be a prime to play, uh, hotel establishment yeah. to be on that list. Yes. And I'm trying to make sure I see if there's any on the side, too. Yes. You said it, Ewani Edwards. Where did you tell me she did say that she is now? She's teaching at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Oh, is she? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just be, um, I have two things. Mm -hmm. One, I'm going to help you out with Dr. Blake. Dr. Blake came to his birth in 1939. Mm -hmm. He delivered me and my son. He lived in white city. And my second is my question is Samuel K. Harris had the first black source gun. Where was it located? Mm -hmm. uh, Where's her there? Maybe the yellow there? Is that reason I'm asking is because I'm doing some work on some blacksmiths, and I remember the blacksmith shop by the governor's palace was owned by a black man. But now I keep hearing from people that I we question that it did not, that it was owned by a white man. So my question is the blacksmith right there by Massachusetts School, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that by a black man started by a black man, or uh, was it actually a white man that started? I'm not sure. Edwin, Edwin, do you remember that story about, uh, or did you ever hear about the story of a black man on his black shop next to the uh, government palace? Uh, maybe so, maybe not. I'm not. I don't want to put you on the spot. 18th century? No, no, no. 20th century. 20th, 20th, 20th century. century. No. I knew that there were, I, knew, I remember from what my dad was telling me that there were a lot of businesses around. Matthew Wade, uh, yeah. uh, but Dr. Timothy, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew Wade, but, but, but he was he, he worked here, he, he uh, worked at the end of the 50s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 1950s. Yeah. I'm talking about Mr. So about 18, Wade, you know, 18, oh, right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I think it's the 18th century. Because I, I vaguely remember. It sounds vaguely familiar, but we'll, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, yeah. I, have to look I, it up. I think I remember. I think I remember. I remember it simply because when he went for the throwing stuff, I asked them, or somebody asked them, about the blacksmith shop. And they said, because it was black only, they had done it before with black history yet. Mm. And it sat there, never being shown as a blacksmith shop. 
Was it pre Hebrew that in the ancient century? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 See, I did not, I did not know that because all the time, uh, all the time I've been here, my own understanding was. You did. Yeah. 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 My next question. Yeah. I want to share with the group is. Where John D. Rockefeller's house is, there used to be, it's so used to be a little cottage which sits on the street. And they had a black shop sitting in front of their door when I was growing up. And I always wondered about this black jockey. And we used to go down there, black kids, every Halloween and knock the black jockey down. And they would be stored every year. So after I got old and went to college, I was 44 when I went to college, I learned that all the jockeys were black. So I really had to start with what I did. And horse racing, of course, is big here. Yes. Was there something you want to say? No, yeah, well, I was just making sure that she got. Oh, okay. Anyone else? I'm trying to make sure I see everyone because we're at the end right now. Yeah, we're at 415. So we thank you very much for coming to the session. The evening performance for the class tonight in the oh. 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 for the Alexa Society at six o'clock. Yes. Y'all serving dinner? <laughs> <laughs>